Now, there's a moment in team life that we've all experienced, I think, where there's an elephant in the room that people don't want to talk about. There's some, maybe it's a moment of feedback that, that needs to be given. Maybe it's a moment of truth. And what happens in a lot of groups is that it, people will not speak out. Why is that? How can you get people to speak out, to share accurate information together? Now, there's a pattern that I saw at the places I visited that was stunning because I kept seeing it over and over again. It was this. It was the leaders sending signals of vulnerability. Leaders. It happened most vividly for me at Pixar. I'm walking around Pixar. How cool is Pixar? It's pretty cool. Um, and they have a new building. It's called Brooklyn. It's their studio building. And it's the coolest building I have ever been in in my life. And I'm, to be fair, I'm from Alaska. We... <laughs> We have one building in the town where we live that has an elevator, and we used to take our kids there to ride it. So I have not been in a lot of cool buildings in my life. But Pixar has genuinely cool buildings. There are bars hidden in in little speakeasies, and just brilliant design touches, and it feels like home, and it feels incredible. And so where I'm walking around Pixar with Ed Catmull, who's the founder and president of Pixar, co-founder and president. And he's one of the most brilliant people in computer animation, and he's, he's... been at Pixar since the start. He was a big part of building this building. And so I'm walking through there with Ed, and I said, just I'm like, this is the coolest building I've ever been in. This is amazing. And he stops, full stop. And he says, actually, this building was a huge mistake. Kind of stops me there. Really? And he said, yeah, the hallways, we made them too narrow, and people don't stop to chat. And we really need people to stop to chat at Pixar. We need that. And we made the atrium too small uh, because it, people don't really want to gather there either. But the biggest mistake that we made, he said, we didn't realize we were making these mistakes when we were building this building. We didn't even realize it. Most of the time when you compliment a leader on the beautiful building, they say thank you. And they mean it. But that's not what he's up to. He's up to sending a signal of vulnerability. I saw it too at the Navy SEALs. There's a commander there named Dave Cooper who trained the team that got Bin Laden. The way he puts it is this. The most important four words a leader can say or I screwed that up. That was the voice of New York Times bestselling author Daniel Coyle, who joins us on the podcast this week for a conversation about his new book, The Culture Playbook. Now, The Culture Playbook is 60 practical tips for building your culture based on three ingredients that we're going to talk about here in our conversation. The first being, how do we build connection between those on our teams? The second reference there in that excerpt uh, interview was the importance of vulnerability from the leader's perspective. And finally, we're going to talk about how to communicate purpose and why that's so important for growing your culture. Welcome back to the Coaching Culture Podcast. I'm joined by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. I'm JP Nurbin, the founder of this podcast and TOC Culture Consulting. Our mission is to provide mentorship and community for leaders all over the world, helping them on their journey. Our podcast, this podcast, it's a way to invite you into that journey uh, to learn with us. And we appreciate you listening in as I do TJ. TJ is a volleyball coach in Iowa who recently reviewed the podcast and said, wow, 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 download now. I have absolutely fell in love with this podcast and content. I believe this type of content should be worked on by every coach every year with every team. Keep up the great work, gentlemen. Thanks to TJ. That makes us feel good. Uh, Whoever you are, please send me an email and I'll send you some coupons for some free online courses and a couple of books. If you haven't already left us a review, please do. Uh, Also, you can head on over to tocculture.com to learn more about our mentorship and coaching program for coaches, uh, our online courses, and you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter, which gives weekly insights uh, and the notes to each week's podcast. Enough of that. Let's get into our conversation with Daniel Coyle. Dan, welcome to the Coaching Culture Podcast. It's uh, awesome to finally be able to connect with you. You and I have emailed back and forth uh, over the years uh, following a couple of your different books as we've tried to implement some of your ideas. And full disclosure, there's probably nobody who's had a greater impact on just changing my thinking in coaching than your work, both in the talent code and the culture code. And so uh, this is exciting to be able to bring you on the podcast here. I want to start a little bit just kind of with your background of how you got interested in studying cultures. Mm-hmm. So you, you wrote the talent code and you talked about skill acquisition and then you kind of veered off, did the secret race and talked about the cycling world a little bit yep. and then landed on the culture code. And now the follow-up book with the, um, the tips for being able to implement that. 
Yep. What what spurred the interest in studying culture? Yeah, when I was doing, well, thanks for having me on the podcast. It is great to connect with you finally in semi-real life. I don't know what we call this, virtual life. Um, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the conversation and what you guys are doing with this podcast and the, the kind of inspiration and information that you're giving to people, which is so important right now. Um, the uh, I guess it started uh, when I visited uh, some of these places for the talent code. You know, that the idea of that book was to go to these weird clusters of of impossible amounts of talent in small places and, and see what, what that's made of. And that, that created the book, The Talent Code. Um, and when I did the research for that book, I found myself in some really interesting spaces, some interesting like music school or a, or a tennis camp or a little league field or a basketball court in some cases. And those places felt different. You know, the, the, and we've all had that experience where we walk into a school or a locker room or a bakery and there's like a chemistry there. And we have a language for thinking about that, those kind of places, right? We just say, oh, they just have great feel. They have great, great, great culture. They have great, you know, and, and there's, there's interactions happening there that are sort of special. And so I think all interesting books, all interesting mysteries, all interesting explorations in our life happen because of mysteries. And for me, that was the mystery. And the mystery was like, that's really cool. What's that made of? Like, what, is, that a, is that just magic? Um, that because that's kind of how we talk about it. We kind of talk about those things. Oh, it's just what was going on in that, you know, San Antonio Spurs locker room was just magic, right? But it's not actually magic when you dig into it. It's a you know, there's behaviors, there's communication, there's there's principles, there's concepts, there's research, um, there's all kinds of kind of uh, lenses you can put on it. And that that was the mystery that sent me on this, where it was like, what's going on there? And so that sent me on this journey of looking at top performing cultures uh, and, and figuring out what that's, what the heck is that made of? I think that's so interesting because in our work with coaches, I think there's a misconception that, you know, great culture is the, res the result of getting the right people in the right place. And then culture just happens. And mm -hmm. clearly, you know, as you've discovered and kind of outlined in, in the culture code and the follow-up book that, no, there, there's some very clear ingredients that are involved. And I, I love kind of in the premise of the new book, you talk about building culture being a, a skill based. It, it's an action oriented process rather than, as you said, some sort of a mystical discovery, you know, that the right group of people with the right leader just happen to, you know, to follow in, fall into. Um, and so I want to start with this, if I can. So if we think about those three ingredients of connection, vulnerability, and shared purpose. I, I want to give you the most common question I get from athletic directors who come to me and they say, I want to build the Johnston way or the Butler way or the Mount Vernon way. We want our core group of values, you know, to, to align within our, all of our different sports. Where do I start? And I tell them the first place to start is make sure that your coaches are connected. And then they say, well, I only have so much time. Can I skip that and get right to the questions? What are the right questions? Why is connection so important to begin with? Well, and, uh, that's great. And uh, that's, a, that's a really beautiful question because it is a logical question. We kind of want to leap ahead to say, okay, what's our 10 values and what's our 12 habits? And we tend to miss out on that super basic level. Um, and I guess I saw that, I felt that for the first time at the, when I visited the San Antonio Spurs. You know, I got there uh, like the day after they had lost a big game to the Oklahoma City Thunder. And Everybody knows Popovich and, you know, everybody knows that he can, he's a great communicator and everything, but the, the amount of time, the first thing he did when he got to the practice was to go straight over and put his hand on the shoulder of a player who had missed the big shot the night before and like establish a reconnection with that player. Super fundamental, basic thing. Didn't have to do that. Weird use of his time, actually. I mean, he should have been scheming or figuring out his plays for the next game, but that, that wasn't on his mind. What was on his mind was establishing that connection. And I saw him do that over and over and over and over again, hand on the shoulder. I love you, man. These, these just really, really basic connective activities. And he's doing it instinctively, but the deeper reason he does it goes back for millions of years. What is the main thing that has allowed our genes to reach us that have allowed our ancestors to survive? It's, it's being safe in a group. It's safety. It's safety. It's knowing we share a future with someone. It's not having a shred of a doubt whether they're in our corner. Our brains are wired to fret and worry and focus and obsess on whether we're connected or not. And so great cultures always start with that active connection. You know, it's, 
it's it's kind of funny. It goes a little bit back to you know where we started this idea that culture sort of feels like magic and just get the right people in the right room and it'll happen. Um, you know, we used to have that same sort of idea about fitness. Like there was this idea that just, oh, great athletes are just kind of born and they have great DNA and that's why they're a great sprinter or a great leaper or anything. And it turns out, of course, that the DNA only goes so far. And what matters is the action. What matters is the behavior. What matters is, is this set of actions that you do every single day. And so approaching connection ends up being because connection is the platform on which everything else happens. You can talk about values all you want, but they don't matter. Every, and actually, if you took the values of the top 10 teams in America and put them in a hat and pulled them out, you couldn't tell which was from which team, right? It's not what the values are. It's what the values do and the context in which those values are, are being used. And that always has to be a platform of strong connection and safety. And that's why good leaders put so much time. When you go back to Pop come, becoming a coach of the Spurs, um, he did it. The, I think he, he came on board and the, the team was historically bad and so bad that they had the first pick, right? They got to pick and there was a guy, uh, Tim Duncan was his name, played at Vanderbilt. And what did Pop do? He actually flew to Tim Duncan's home in the Virgin Islands and they spent four days together. And how much did they talk about basketball? Zero. Zero. How many co people would have done that? How many people would have actually had the image to say, I'm going to go get to know this person, his family, his culture, his community, his island, really interesting place, and I'm going to spend time and we are not going to talk about basketball once. People think that it's the scheme that Pop has or the basketball IQ he has, and it's not. It's the safety IQ. It's the connection IQ. And that's the piece. And the cool piece of that is that it's all really doable stuff. Like, it's not some big inspiring speech. It's the hand on the shoulder. Or it's thinking ahead. I saw, I saw it happen one time on, on a minor league bus. There was a TV on the bus, minor league baseball. There was a TV on the bus. And one of the coaches, they're watching the major league game. And these are players who are in like low A, right? So they're a few years from the big leagues, if at all. Maybe 5% of them will make it. And they're watching the game. And somebody gets a hit in the game. And one of the coaches says, you know, a couple of years ago, that guy on TV was sitting right there where you're sitting now. Like super simple thing to say, right? Didn't take much. But in that moment, he created this connection, right? This connection where we're all, we're all connected on this journey. He was sitting in the seat you're now, and he's in the big leagues. Pretty cool. So looking for those moments um, and, and building on them and being really attentive. Another place you see it is in the way they prepare for the first meeting with a player or with a person. Um, all the good coaches and leaders I've seen spend time studying photographs beforehand. Like you'll walk into, I do some work with the Cleveland Guardians, and you'll walk into the room in spring training, and there's the coach, Terry Francona, and he, he'll do these, uh, some do, do these printouts of all the players' photos so he can look at them. So why does he do that? It seems like a weird use of time, right? He should be, you know, working on his tactics. He should be working on his strategy. He should be looking at the analytics. No, he's looking at faces so that when Jose walks down the hall, who's he's 19, he's never been in big league camp before. Terry Francona can go over to him and put his hand on his shoulder and say, welcome. It's great to see you, Jose. Like that moment is what is what creates that safety and tuning into that moment and seeking creative entrepreneurial ways to connect is is one of the more important skills. It's not it's not magic. It's a skill that you can learn because that's what, that's the connective tissue of your team. That's, that's the platform on which everything else you do is going to happen. I got to follow up to that because, you know, it, it's, I remember reading the culture code and, and, and reading that segment around these skills, right? You, you talk about these little behaviors, you know, the, the physical touch, close uh, proximity, you know, laughter, you know, a little bit of banter, you know, all these different things. And you talk about how those are the, the qualities or skills that you see out of great leaders, not the fiery inspirational speeches. And so I remember actually, I, I took some of those things that you mentioned there, added maybe a few other things to it. And I started calling it like the communication code. And I would have coaches self-assess themselves on, on how they saw themselves in those things. The big question then became, you know, we're saying skills. How much do you think Pop has actually developed those skills in an intentional way over the course of his career or other leaders like that? Because I think sometimes people go, 
oh, I just have it or I don't. You know, I'm just, this is just the way that I am. Uh, and we struggle to sometimes see those things as like skills. And we see them more as personality. Like you describe pop as like, you know, like the, the fun uncle that comes in and he's sloppy and he's eating, you know, <laughs> you know, food and he's got his Hawaiian shirt on and his hair is everywhere. You know, like how much is that his personality and how much has he actually had to work at that? I think it's sort of, it depends on the person, but it's kind of all of us, right? Like I, I think we're all, all of us have got parts of our personality that are, um, you know, that are just sort of instinctive and others that are kind of guided instinct. And I think what coaches have is the ability to kind of zoom out and see the impact they have on others. That's where their focus is, right? Their focus is not on what is my instinct right now. Like they're not in their own heads. They're continually zoomed out. I've heard some people talk about the, the importance of like getting on the roof. And I like that saying, because you kind of get on the roof of the building you're in now, look down, where can you have the most impact, right? Who needs you the most? And that, that the quality that I see in good coaches is that they're so focused on their impact that they sort of forget about themselves, right? They're not, they're not focused on, is this something that I would do? Is, does this sound like me? Do I feel comfortable? They're not interested. They're interested in the other person and that interest and that curiosity. Um, and you see it in, in great coaches because they're, they, they will repeat the same message or try the same signal over and over again until they get like what they were looking for, until they get a reaction. They'll keep reaching out to that player who's being really shy or, or who's being uh, really standoffish. They'll keep making efforts because they're not feeling insulted when they get pushed back and they're not feeling like it's about them. So I think it's this other focus that they share that allows them to behave in ways that continually sharpen those behaviors into skills because they're, they're always getting good feedback, right? Like, oh, I gave that really fiery speech. Uh, it didn't work very well, right? A, a, a bad coach thinks, I gave that fiery speech. What's wrong with them, right? They should have been fired up today. What is wrong with these people? Why didn't they hear me? A good coach says, huh, I gave that speech. It didn't land. Like it actually had no effect. So I really need to rethink my next five communications with this team because this is not going to get where we want to go. So it's all a question of that, that on the roof perspective and the perspective drives the behavior and creates the skill. Like everything is in that. If you can get on the roof and focus on the impact you're having, you'll naturally develop those sorts of skills because you're going to be continually like in conversation with your team. Like all of these things are kind of, all culture is a conversation, right? It's not like you can just sort of, it's not like cooking where you can say, I'm going to put these five ingredients together. And at the end, we're going to have a pancake. Like that's not how culture is because you've got people on both sides and you're going to send a signal and they're going to respond in some way. Like they're going to like either run away or maybe they'll come together in a good way. And then you'll send another signal and then they'll behave a different way. Then you'll send another signal and that'll change you too. So it's this, back and forth thing that I think good cultural leaders are involved in. So they're attuned to the signals they send and the signals they get back with this eye of like, man, how can we be more together? How can we get where we're going? I want to follow up on that with maybe a chicken and the egg uh, question for you, kind of based on one of the, I guess, experiments, one of the ways we tried implementing this idea of connection. And JP mentioned you know, in the book, there's a list of it, it's the touch, it's the laughter, it's the, you know, the small micro interaction, right? And so, you know, one of the questions that naturally, I think, comes from that when you read that is, well, these are characteristics of groups that are already close. Mm -hmm. You think about friends that are close and have history, they're going to walk closer together, they're going to have a, their own language, they're going to touch more. And so what I wondered was, when after I read this is, what happens if I take a group of kids that haven't played together? And I ask them, I create an environment where the signals are part of the rules of the game. So, for example, we do a lot of trading games when we're doing new teams, like in our summer camp. So they get cards and the rules are you have to exchange a card with somebody else. But here's what you have to do. You have to walk up. You have to shake their hand, look them in the eye, introduce yourself. You have mm -hmm. to make an exchange. And then we always close our conversations with a fist bump or a handshake or whatever. We do speed dating. where We sit them across from each other. The rules are you have to give them eye contact. You have to not. So we're, we're scripting some of those behaviors that 
can that lead to connection or is that just, do you think, evidence of connection that already exists? I think it can lead to connection. Does speed dating lead to connection in either your version or real world version? Yes. Well, yeah, it does. We've had great success with it. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it does. And I, I, because I think what you've got is a feedback loop there, right? You know, and, and all these cultures, the, the main, the core feedback loop, and you can think of it as kind of the beating heart, is this, this feedback between safety and vulnerability, where you're sending a signal, hey, we're, we're safe here. And because we're safe, we're going to take this little risk. Right. And we're going to ask you to reach out and we're going to ask you to do something maybe you're not comfortable with doing. And then that's going to make you feel if it goes like we think it'll go. And if it goes well, that'll make you feel even safer, which will let you take even more of a risk. And so all human connection is in this like pulse beat of this. We're safe. Now we're more open, which makes us feel safer, which makes us more open. And so even when. So to go back to your question of like, is this just a symptom of successful groups? the interesting thing is how fragile it always is. I would say there's like no such thing as that. You never get with culture, you never get in a position of like, we're there, like we're done, we're safe, right? San Antonio Spurs, while I was there, while I was studying them, Kawhi Leonard takes off for the, you know, he sort of had that big injury thing. And was he really injured? Was he not? Caused a huge fraction on the team. And, and with, the Navy SEALs, who I spent some time studying, they've had huge issues with, uh, with potential violence and, and morale problems. Pixar, um, you know, great culture. They've also had challenges. Nobody, that's the big, I think, collective misunderstanding we have about culture, that there's this feeling like it's a really stable thing that great cultures just get on this spot where everything's perfect and it will always be perfect. And it's not, it's alive. It's this living thing. And so even with cultures that have it, they're only a few interactions away from losing it at any, at any given time. Um, the, the real separator with good cultures, and I'd put the San Antonio and, and some others in, the, in, this, in this category, is that when something bad happens, when they have a Kawhi Leonard thing happen, they stop, they acknowledge it, they accept what happened, and they start to try to make it better. They, they circle up around the problem and try to repair it instead of ignoring it or villainizing someone. Um, so this, this idea of when there's a problem, our reflex is to, is to make it better together. That's really right. Bruce Perry uses this phrase of rupture and repair, right? And mm-hmm. there's this constant maintenance that's going on with those relationships, you know, in an organization or in a team. And I guess that brings me to the next question here, kind of thinking about vulnerability. One of the things when I read the book the first time, and I think JP and I even discussed this on the podcast and we did a, a series afterwards, I thought vulnerability was about personal disclosure. And mm-hmm. in my mind, I thought, okay, we're connected. We have this place of safety. And now it's okay for me to peel back the onion and sort of let myself be seen. And I think there's certainly an element of that in great culture. But mm-hmm. the more I've listened to you kind of in some of your podcasts recently and obviously reading through the book, it seems like vulnerability you're defining a little bit differently as honest candor rather than just personal disclosure. And I wonder if you could just talk about the difference and why that matters. Yeah, no, it's really interesting in that. that I think it, it comes down to the fact that this concept of vulnerability is really moving through our culture at a high velocity, right? Like this, this is a word that none of us used regularly five years ago, and now we use it all the time. And to the point where I was at a sort of a tech gathering with a big tech company recently, and somebody told me that there were consultants in that industry who were training CEOs to like be more vulnerable on camera. They were saying like, when you give that camera message, you, if you could just have like, just like well up or have your voice crack a little bit, like really kind of weaponizing this personal disclosure piece of vulnerability. And it's, which is <laughs> insane over on a million levels. Like imagine, you know, Bill Belichick is going to let a single tear slide down his cheek during a, during a team meeting or something. But um, it really highlights the fact uh, of what the distinction you're talking about. You know, vulnerability is not about talking about your childhood or making telling secrets or getting super emotional. It's actually about visibility, right? It's about letting people in and giving them a voice in how you're going to do things. And, and it's, it's creating a group brain that can solve problems together. And the reason it's so important is that 
we're reflexively really authoritarian. Players want to say, yes, coach. And coaches want the players to say, yes, coach, right? And, assi- and you want your assistants to say, yes, coach. And we're reflexively authoritarian. And so to actually stop and say, wait a minute, this is just my first idea. Like, I need your help to make this better. I, not just like, hey, you got any ideas, but actually expressing that extra bit and saying, I really need you guys to take a look at this game plan. I really need you guys to look at this. There was a time I, I spent part of the year in, in Cleveland. And so this story about, I think it was the first time the, the Warriors beat the Cavs in the finals. And it was right before either game six or game seven. And uh, the Warriors were having trouble defending LeBron. And, and there was a, a guy who was a film intern. He was a video intern for the, for the Warriors. And he spoke up in a meeting right before the last game with a suggestion of how they could change the defense. And Steve Kerr did it. He, he took that suggestion and it had an impact on the game. Um, how many cultures would the film and video intern have felt comfortable speaking, being vulnerable? And how many cultures would a head coach have felt comfortable saying, no, 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 let's listen to this guy. He might have some. Let's change the game plan. I think he's right. That's vulnerability. And it's about the sharing of candid information. It's about doing it in a way that, that maintains the connection and creating these constant feedback loops. You know, you're trying to build a group brain. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to have the metaphor that I go back to over and over again with culture is like, your group is like a flock of birds flying through a forest at high speed, right? And you can't have one bird with a little general hat on saying, everyone turn left here at this tree and then turn right. And then we're going to go underneath that branch. No, you're self-organizing at high speed, right? You're sharing information. You're staying connected. That's the safety part we've already talked about. But the vulnerability part is sharing information with everybody so everybody can self-organize and make a decision and, and fly around where you want to fly. And so that's what vulnerability is really about, which has nothing to do with you know, your childhood or your deep emotions. It has everything to do with you being really, really honest about where you're strong, about where you're weak, about where your team is strong or where your team is weak, and being relentlessly and warmly candid with each other so that you can get better together. All right, that's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with more Daniel Coyle. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it.